too involved to do all in one evening. So uh, we'll start with this. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you for the privilege we can study it, not just use it for daily devotional, but to use it for what it is, your word, and to appreciate what's here. And I thank you for the opportunity and people that we can study together with who are able to delve into these things and uh, in, in more than just a surface way. And I pray these things might be of help to us as we do study your word in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, the question is this. I need help understanding how James, through the book of the Revelation, is for doctrine, reproof, and correction. Also, I don't understand the edification designed for Israel and the, uh, or the, the fifth course of judgment. And uh, do you have some verses that can help me with this? Uh, then they ask, have you, my son and I are studying James verse by verse. Do you have uh, teachings on that? Well, if you, want, if you want to go through the James studies, you have to call the office and get the DVDs. I'm not sure if they're on the, on, I couldn't tell you where to find them on YouTube. Maybe they haven't been put up there because I did those years ago. But uh, if they aren't and you'd like to put them on there, we'd be happy for you too. If you look our ministry up on YouTube, almost everything that we've ever done is available on YouTube for free. Uh, there are things that you can get here if you want a DVD. Well, then we have that stuff here too. But you, you, we have to, you have to pay for the DVDs because they cost money. YouTube, it's all up, and then it's you know it, it's just there. So, uh, if you want the studies in the Book of James, look for that. If not, call the office. But as far as the the issue of Hebrews to Revelation. And specifically, the, the issue of doctrine and proof and correction. So if you've got the book of Hebrews, hold your hand and come with me in 2 Timothy chapter 3. What that's about, and you'll be familiar with this, Hebrews chapter, I'm, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, when you study the Scripture, it's going to be profitable. And it says it's profitable for doctrine. Let's do it like this. Doctrine, reproof, and correction. Now, those three issues, doctrine, reproof, and correction will turn themselves out to be instruction in righteousness. The way you get instruction in righteousness is by having doctrine, the teaching. Here's what God says. Here's, the, here's what God says about the issue. Reproof is when your conduct doesn't match that doctrine. And reproof says, no, that's not what, that's, your behavior isn't matching the doctrine up here. Correction is how you fix your thinking, so that it matches the doctrine. So reproof has to do with your behavior. Correction has to do with your thinking in relationship to the doctrine. Now, Paul's epistles are laid out, doctrine, reproof, correction. They start out with Romans, doctrine. Romans is about the cross. Corinthians is reproof. The Corinthians were not living in light of the issues he teaches in Romans about justification sanctification, and the walk in your life. Galatians is a book of correction. Romans and Galatians are called the great books of the Reformation because Galatians, the issue here is you're not, here you're, you're, you're justified by grace through faith plus nothing, and Galatians are trying to add the law. So Galatians are making a doctrinal mistake in relationship to Romans. The Corinthians are making a behavior mistake. They're not living like who they are. You move to the next book in, 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 in Paul's business is Ephesians. It's a book of doctrine. It's a book of doctrine about the church, the body of Christ. Why is God forming the body of Christ? What's his purpose? Philippians is reproof about the one body. They're not living in that oneness. Colossians is about they're not holding the head. They've made some doctrinal mistakes. Then you come to Thessalonica. Thessalonians, that's a book of doctrine about the coming of Christ. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians talks about the rapture. 2 Thessalonians talks about his revelation in the day of the Lord. After Thessalonians, there are no more church epistles. 
There are nine church epistles that Paul writes to churches. They match doctrine, approve, correction. Now, after Thessalonica, after, after Thessalonians, there aren't any more churches. There, there are Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, the personal epistles written to pastors in local churches about the work of the ministry. But the nine church epistles have to do with the doctrine, reproof, and correction that makes up instruction of righteousness for the function of the body of Christ. By the way, after the Lord comes, the doctrine of Thessalonians, you don't need any more reproof and correction because you got it. You know, you're, you're, you're there. Now that pattern, and you know, we go over that because this is the doctrinal edification structure for the body of Christ. You start out with my gospel. Preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the, the body of Christ, and then the scriptures of the prophet. That's how it all fits together with everything else. The Hebrew epistles, Hebrews to Revelation, have exactly the same kind of structure as the way they are. Li- and by the way, this is why the books are in the canon of scripture in the order that they're in. Your Bible is not put together in the chronological order in which the books are written. It's put together in a spiritual order of progressive edification. So if you start in Romans Romans, and you just read through Paul's epistles, you'll go through my gospel, preaching in Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and the scriptures of the prophets. You'll go through them in that order there. So even if you don't know about this, and most people don't, if you just studied them, you'd get the edification without being conscious that you're getting it which is okay as long as you get it. Now, the Hebrew epistles are going to do exactly the same thing, and they are in your Bible written in exact, or, or, or collated in exactly that same design. Now, there are nine Hebrew epistles, Hebrews to Revelation, just like there are nine church epistles. And they, they're ordered together in your Bible in that way. So let, let's start. Start with the book of Hebrews. And let's just talk about these epistles just for a minute to start with. Understand that Hebrews to Revelation, who would you think the book of Hebrews is written to? Kind of obvious, okay? Hebrews. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So who did Christ preach to when he came? Matthew chapter 10, he commissions his his apostles, gives them the great commission. He says, don't go to the Gentiles, just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's why Paul says in Romans 15, 8, that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. The book of Hebrews is written to those people to whom Christ ministered. Now chapter 2, verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So the salvation in the book of Hebrews is the salvation Jesus was talking about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and divers, miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. That's the early part of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit doesn't come till Acts 2. So he says, I'm talking to you about a salvation, began to be spoken by Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then was confirmed to us in the early Acts period by the Pentecostal church. Now, by the way, that verse by itself demonstrates to you that nothing new began at Pentecost. The idea that the church, the body of Christ, began at Pentecost, or that any church began at Pentecost, is just not scriptural. It's it's good, popular belief, but it's not true. By the way, there's a lot of stuff that's popular belief that aren't true. I was reading a guy yesterday. <laughs> he was talking about how he helped. He, he, was, um, he was liberated from the old, the old ways, and, and, and when he knew he was, it was when, he, when he, he had an Easter bunny come to church. And, you know, what? You know, what put that in my mind was just hearing him. But there are people that believe in Easter bunnies. And there are people that preach about Easter bunnies and promote Easter bunnies. But Easter bunnies aren't true. Okay? You can have an Easter egg hunt where the Easter bunny laid the eggs in the yard, but Easter bunnies don't lay eggs. 
Now, you do sometime, but, metaf you know, metaphorically. In fact, you lay some pretty nice colored ones sometimes, metaphorically speaking, you understand. But not, you don't go look them up in the yard out there. So there's a lot of things people say are true that turn out not to be true. That's a ridiculous illustration. But just because somebody says something doesn't make it the way it is. There's a verse right there that tells you that what Christ taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the church he started back there is the church that's there and the ministry that's there in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Nothing changes till you get to the Apostle Paul. Now, those people have some scripture written to them. They have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they also have some more scripture written to them, and that's what Hebrews to Revelation is going to be. Look, notice verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. Now you have time past, but now the age is to come. But you see the last part of verse 5? Whereof we speak. So what does the writer of the book of Hebrews think he's talking about? Time past, but now are the ages to come. He thinks he's talking about the world to come. That's talking about the time when Christ comes back, sets up his kingdom, and rules and reigns as the, uh, as the Messiah. So the book of Hebrews is a book about that kingdom program that Christ preached in his, in, his, in his earthly ministry, that the apostles offered Israel in the early Acts period, and that this little group of believers that came out of that Pentecostal church are, are being talked about not to forsake. So he writes Hebrews, and it's especially written to that group of people focusing on the ages to come. You see how time past comes along and it gets interrupted. Prophecy gets interrupted by the mystery. That which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, that Peter talks about in Acts 3 going on, gets interrupted by that which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. That's the but now. When that interruption is taken out, he'll finish the prophetic program and put them together. Right now they're separated. These people here are going to have a counterpart over here after the dispensation of grace, and these folks over here are going to need Scripture written to them to explain to them what's going on. And that's what these books are going to be about. Now, Hebrews is going to talk to you about that future day. Come with me to the book of James. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation, knowing this is the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, notice, the book of James is specifically written to a specific group of people. See what it says there? Written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Now, outside of Sam here tonight, nobody could claim to be one of those tribes, but Sam doesn't know which tribe he's a part of anyway, do you, Sam? No? Okay. He just Jewish background. But you see, here are these 12 tribes. We're not a part of it. That's Israel. We know who the 12 tribes are in the Bible. That's who James says it. So before you get all hot and bothered and hot and excited about what's in the book of James, you're never going to believe verse 2 to the end of the chapter to the end of the book if you don't believe verse 1. So the book of James is written about the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And he says to them in verse 4, Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So the book of James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad in a time of persecution. If you look at chapter number 5, verse number 7. <clears throat> Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until, the, er, he, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door, before the door. Well, now ask, let me ask you something. I've been talking to you in the morning the last couple of weeks about 
our hope. Is your hope the judge standing in the door? No, the judge, Revelation 19, verse 11 says, I saw heaven open, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes out on a white horse to judge and make war. That's not his coming for the body of Christ. That's his coming to establish his kingdom, destroy his enemies, and avenge his, his people. So James focuses on that future time. Look at 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the, to the sca strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Who is he writing to? Again, he's writing to that group of people who are scattered out among the, the, uh, the, the, the Gentiles. Verse chapter number 2. Verse number 9, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. When you read that verse, that ought to make your mind immediately think of a passage in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter number 19, verse 5, that uses exactly that terminology to describe God's plan for the nation Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. And Moses tells them, that God has said he's going to make you a peculiar people, going to make you a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood, and so forth. This is, again, he's writing to the believing remnant in the nation Israel. And if you wonder that about that, which in time past, verse 10, were not a people, but now are the people of God. Verse number 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. These people aren't Gentiles. They're out among the Gentiles. So when you're reading these books, come with me to Second Peter. When you're reading these books, Hebrews to Revelation, when you're looking and you always ask, who's writing? To whom are they writing? And then what did they say? When you read these things, you, you know immediately that you're talking about something different than what Paul's talking about. Second Peter chapter 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them which have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he begins to talk to them about what they're doing, verse number um, 10. Wherefore the, the, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, you should not never fail. For at so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, these are kingdom saints. Come with me to 1 John. And while you're doing that, go back and get Galatians chapter number 2. There's a passage in Galatians chapter 2 that if, if the average evangelical pastor, preacher, Bible teacher, or believer would come to grips to what's going on in Galatians chapter 2, it would completely change the... The confusion, the irrelevance, and uh, the frustration that you see in the evangelical world all about you and that has come to a head in the last four months or so, five months, what is this, August, six months now. Uh, first you had the, the COVID, the China virus. And that demonstrated that all these people out here claiming to be healers, God talking to them, speaking for word for God, were a bunch of frauds. You've got some of the leaders in that word of faith, health and wealth movement, who are on the president's council of religious advisors. If they had the ability to do what they said they could do, they would just say, okay, President Trump will take care of it, and we'll go banish it. In fact, they did that. You've seen the videos. People like Kenny Copeland, people like Paula White, who's the head of that, that group. All kind of these guys. 
and they were cursing the COVID, forbidding it to come. And what happened? It just rolled in anyway. What do they do? They just say, well, okay, something must have been wrong. Yeah. What's wrong is your doctrine. What's wrong is you. And it demonstrates you're a fraud. You claim one thing and, and, and you do another. That's crooked. That's religious chicanery. Now, you'd have thought that it would have put them all out of business. It didn't. And I thought about that. Why didn't it put them out of business? Well, you know, everybody wants health and wealth. That, that's a common desire for anybody. People fear death and they fear poverty. And that promise, you just hold it out there. Then you had the governmental unrest, the political unrest that came about because of the, uh, the murder of George Floyd and all the political stuff that's come up from that. Can I tell you, when you hear the one, of the, one of the, one of the craftiest, actually ingenious branding that you've ever seen is the Black Lives Matter stuff. The Black Lives Matter, Inc., the organization, is an anarchist Marxist organization whose goal is to produce anarchy and the overthrow of our government. That's, the whole, that, that's their goal. That's what they say their goal is. But what did they do? They took a sentiment. If you know anything about the black community, you know that for centuries they have held up their hand and say, we matter too. We want to be treated equally. We want to be treated justly. And in large measure, they haven't been. And so if you said, we matter too, black lives matter also, you would have the sentiment of the black community. What they did is they took that sentiment, branded it, and attached it to a revolutionary anarchist political movement. And now if you say anything against it, against that movement, people say you're against those people. It's, it's an ingenious kind of thing. It's deception at the most basic level. The only answer to any of that, to the false claims that people hold out and disappoint that don't work. Listen, God isn't talking to Paula White when she says she is, and I know she's the big, the big teacher. She talks about God. Talk. If that Bible is complete, he isn't talking to her. And I don't care how many followers she has, and I don't care how many Southern Baptist preachers that, that say she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. When you say that God is continuing to speak to people today, you just said Joseph Smith with the Mormons and, and Russell with the Jehovah Witnesses and Muhammad with the, with, his, with, with the Quran are all legitimate. Because if God is still, still talking, he's, they've got as much right to say God talked to them with their evidences as she has God talking to her with her evidences. It's the cultic doctrine of continuing inspiration, and it's a part of their cult. Evangelicals don't have sense enough to, or, or backbone enough to, to name it for what it is because they've been swept away into that confusion. All of that would be corrected in Galatians chapter 2. It's a fascinating passage right here. Now, I'm not getting much about James and Hebrews and Revelation. I'm, I'm kind of off the subject, but let me finish this because this will help over there. In Galatians 2, Paul describes his account, his account of his going to Jerusalem in Acts 15 and meeting with Peter, James, John, and the Pentecostal church. He went up by revelation. Christ sent him up there to communicate the message he was preaching among the Gentiles. Verse number 6, Galatians 2, 6, but these who seem to be somewhat... Whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. What he's saying there is what matters is what God says, not what people say or who, think, who people think the guy's saying it is. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So they couldn't tell Paul anything he didn't already know. Paul was a rabbinical scholar. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He knew 
all about Israel's program. He knew the Hebrew Bible. He was a teaching scholar in it. They didn't tell him anything he didn't know about God's prophetic program. But contrary wise, now you think about that. If, you can't, if I can't tell you anything you don't already know, but the opposite happens, what happened? I, I can't, you can't tell me anything that, well, I can't tell you anything you didn't already know. But if the opposite happens, you told me something I didn't know. You see, Paul had some information that they didn't, that, that, that Israel's people didn't know about. Even though they knew all about prophecy, Paul said, I'm preaching something that was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Something preached about, talked about, made known since the world began is different from something that was kept secret since the world began, but now is made known. So Paul said, I went up there and I told them what I'm preaching. They couldn't tell me anything I didn't know. I knew all about prophecy, but I told them something about this secret program, this new program that they didn't know. Now watch what they do. Verse 7, they saw, when they saw, the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now, if you know anything about life, you know that circumcision and uncircumcision are two diametrically opposite things. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John that's James, Peter, and John. We're reading the book of James. After James comes first and second Peter. After first and second Peter come first, second, and third John. These three men are going to write four of those books we're going to be reading over there. You with me? Notice what they do. When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So who does Peter, James, and John say they're going to minister to? The circumcision. That's the believing remnant in Israel. And everybody else, Paul ministers to. So when they write James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, who do you think they wrote those books to? Gentiles or Israel? You see that? You get that in your mind, and now. Look, I understand it throws out a lot of Sunday school lessons and it throws out a lot of preaching. But it clears up a lot of confusion. Come with me to the book of 1 John. These books are written by those circumcision leaders who had agreed that they're going to minister to Israel, to the believing remnant in Israel, while Paul goes to the Gentiles. 1 John chapter 1 and that which was from the beginning. Now the, these epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, are the only one of the epistles that don't have a name on them. Well, Hebrews doesn't either. And it's interesting because all 13 of Paul's epistles have his name, first word in, their, in those books. James, Peter, Jude, and Revelation all have the name of the author. I don't know any reason to doubt that John wrote this. But it's interesting that his name isn't attached to it, as Hebrews hasn't got a name attached to it. But obviously they knew who he was. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, and which we have seen with our eyes. He's talking about we the apostles. Which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest and we saw it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest unto us. Notice they've literally handled, they've been with the Lord Jesus Christ physically, and they handle of the word of life. These are the men who accompanied with him. 
I think that's probably why John didn't put his name on it, because he's speaking for the apostles. Now, when he does that, if you come over to chapter... I'll just read verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you, may also, that you also may have fellowship with us. That's what Hebrews chapter 2 was saying. What we saw, what we learned back over there, we're telling you so you can be a part of that true fellowship which we have with him. Chapter 2, verse 18, little children. By the way, look chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. If any man have an advocate with the Father, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. These are Israel's apostles. You remember Jesus told the apostles, Matthew, Mark 10, Matthew 20, he said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to give his life a ransom for many. And that many is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8. He lays down his life for, Isaiah says, for my people, for Israel. It's not till you come to Paul that you see he gave his life a ransom for all. And there again, when you don't, when you don't make the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ, you become a covenant Calvinist, and you say, he didn't die for everybody because it says many. They don't understand what that's about or why it's that way. When you come to Paul, he says it's for everybody. We've all been included now. Well, anyway, come with me, if you will, over to the book of Jude. By the way, Jude is a contraction for the name Judas. There were two men by the name of Judas in the 12 apostles. Did you know that? Did you remember that? That's why Judas Iscariot is always identified as Judas Iscariot and as the traitor. But there was another Judas in the, among the apostles, and he's the one that writes the book of Jude. So these books are written by apostles. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to whom... Uh, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and call, mercy be unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. So you have another one of these apostles. If you look down at verse 14, Enoch was, Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of those things, said, Behold, the Lord cometh with, with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all them and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which, which they have ungodly committed and of all their un hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's the Christ coming in judgment. The book of Revelation, the same kind of thing. And I'm going to stop because what I'm trying to establish for you is that those books, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earthly ministry of Christ to Israel. You have the book of Acts. It starts out giving the offer, a renewed opportunity of Israel to repent. They refuse it. The fall of Israel takes place. Salvation goes to the Gentiles through Paul's ministry. Romans through Philemon, Paul's epistles, <clears throat> explain to you what's going on in Paul's ministry in the dispensation of grace, why the wrath doesn't come, why grace has been extended, and how God's forming a new agency of people, the body of Christ, to use in the heavenly places. After this, this dispensation's over, and the body of Christ is taken out, he'll go back and finish the things he promised Israel. That's why Paul says, God isn't finished with Israel. The, the, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind when he makes a promise. And all the things he promised Israel, he'll do. Then you have Hebrews, the Revelation, which give you the instructions for what's going to take place with them after the dispensation of grace is over. So these books specifically, Hebrews, you have Hebrews, then you have James, then you have 1 Peter, then you have 2 Peter, then you have the epistles of John, 
then you have Jude, then you have the book of the Revelation. And they do doctrine, reproof, correction, doctrine, proof, correction, doctrine, and then there's no more reproof or correction because the kingdom's here. They do exactly for these people in the ages to come what Paul's epistles do for us. Now, we need another 45 minutes to go through this in detail. I'm not going to do that. But each of these doctrine books set, set the theme for the reproof and correction that comes. Hebrews explains the cross to Israel just like Romans explains the cross to the body of Christ. Hebrews will, pl will, will play the same role for these people that Romans plays as the foundation of grace for us. The book of the Revelation is about the coming of Christ, and it will provide the same future hope for the body of Christ that the Thessalonian epistles would provide for the body of Christ. So what you're having is this doctrinal edification process that goes across there. Second Peter is going to focus on the congregation just like Ephesians focuses on the congregation for the body of Christ. So you're going to have that doctrinal progression, the cross, issues of grace, the congregation and the issue of, of, of guarding the godliness, and then the coming that is the future glory. And just as that edification process in Ephesians, I'm, I'm sorry, Romans through Thessalonians provides for us, this will provide for that coming group of people. God's interesting, interested in having edified, fully functioning adult members of his family. And you do that through the edification of sound doctrine. Now, the book of Hebrews is going to provide for you, uh, if you come back there with me, Hebrews, the issue, the issue in Hebrews is, is the, the cross work of Christ in connection with his promises and, pl and, and plans for the nation Israel. And you'll see in chapter 2, verse number 9, for example, but we see Jesus who, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by him all things uh, are, are all things, in becoming many sons, unto, uh, bringing many sons unto glory, who made the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are one, or of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Now that's a quote, I and the children, from Isaiah chapter 8, talking about the little, the, 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 the redeemed remnant in Israel. The quote in verse number 12, I will declare my name, thy name among the brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praises. People say, well, see, there's the church. We're the church. It must be us. But the term church just means a group, of, a group of people that belong to God, called out group of his. That's a quote from Psalm chapter 22. And if the church, the body of Christ, is a secret that the psalmist didn't know about, then that's not a reference to the body of Christ. What that's a reference to is Jesus said, I'll, on this, this, this rock, I'll build my church. And it gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's the, that's the Messiah's church, just like it is in Psalm chapter number 22. You go back there and read it. Verse number 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took on him, took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came to be Israel's redeemer. Now, he talks, talks to him in chapter 3. He's better than Moses. 
He's better than Melchizedek. He has a better sacrifice than they had in the, under the, the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament uh, laws and regulations. Chapter 3, uh, chapter 9, I'm sorry, verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, for the blood of bulls and goats, and the ashes of a heifer, heifer sprinkled with uh, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works? He's the better sacrifice that pro provides a better covenant, not the old covenant, but the new covenant. Provides better promises and a better inheritance. And it's all based upon what he did for Israel at Calvary. So Hebrews explains, we're not under the Mosaic covenant anymore, guys. We've been placed under a new covenant that God promised us back in Jeremiah, but that Jesus Christ, through his cross work, has made possible. And it explains, Hebrews, one of the great transi three transition books in the Bible, Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. And we transition from Israel's Old Testament to their New Testament, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, all because of the cross work of Christ. He's Israel's Redeemer. Now, if you come to the book of James, once you have that doctrine about who, you are, who they are, and they understand that, now their faith is to rest on that and produce a life that reflects that. That's why the book of James is all about being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Now, when you see people use the book of James in James chapter 2 and, and, and being big justification there and so forth, James is talking, and you see how he says it in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, and that's exactly what's going to happen as they go through the trials of the tribulation, works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Notice how he says perfect is to be wanting nothing, entire, whole. Perfect is not the sense of sinless, because you're never going to be that in this life. Perfect is the sense of being complete, being a fully functioning person. And that's the goal, the perfecting of their faith, that perfecting, that edification, that perfecting work. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Don't just hear it, but do it. Because if you don't do it, you didn't hear it. That's why in chapter 2, when he says in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, Romans 4, Paul talks about Abraham being justified by faith without works, but he's not talking about Genesis 22. He's talking about Genesis 15. Two entirely different situations. Well, what happened in Genesis 22? Verse 22 Seeing how, seest how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made what? Perfect. You see, they're talking about the perfecting of Abraham's faith. They're talking about the perfect. You, you've got this, this status in grace now, guys. Here's this grace of the covenant. Now, you need to put that in operation. And James focuses on their behavior not matching their identity that God gave them in the new covenant. Then you come to 1 Peter. And now you're going to find the issue of correction. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath according to his abundant mercy, have begotten us again under a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us. 
Revelation 22, he says he's got that, that inheritance for him. He's going to bring it back down here. He goes there, Luke 19, receives the kingdom and brings it back. And it's there waiting to be brought. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we're looking to that future salvation. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, of your faith even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So here, here's that. The law was, came by, was given by Moses, grace and truth, the new covenant for Israel. They found grace in the wilderness, Jeremiah says, to them when he gives them that covenant. Now, if you come with me over to this one passage, chapter 4, They're going to have to have a certain mindset to keep them in the grace of God in that time of, of Jacob's trouble. Chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning your, the fiery trial which is to try you. That's what the tribulation is going to be. As though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you shall be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. And on their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, to watch, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall, and that's what the tribulation is called, actually, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. The seventh week of Daniel, chapter 9, those 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. They're not sent to try and, 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 and uh, judge the Gentiles. Christ will do that when he comes back. They're sent to separate out and purge out the unbelieving in the nation Israel. That's why they're called the times of Jacob's trouble. Everybody worries about the Antichrist. Everybody worries about all that stuff like, it, like it's you know, all about us. In the Bible, it's not about us. It's not about anything happening in the United States of America. It's not going to be about somebody sticking a needle in you or putting a vaccine in you or something under your, your skin to track you. You aren't that important in this issue. <laughs> Makes you feel real good, doesn't it? Wow, you came here to hear that tonight, didn't you? <laughs> You're important somewhere else, but not in that. But if you don't know that and you think that's all, oh, no wonder people get scared to death. They got, you know, like a bunch of black, blind bats flying backward in a dark cave. They don't know what's going on. For the time has come, verse 17, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at, at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the ungodly in the sinner appear? Where shall the ungodly? Now watch. Whereof let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. He said, I've got a purpose in creation and until sin has come to an end where I'm going to destroy it, this is what's going to happen. That's why in James chapter 5, he tells them, you've heard of the patience of Job. There are going to be people in that day teaching them the book of Job. He said, you've heard the, the end of Job. What happened at the end? God restored him. But before he restored him, he spent 42 months 
in abject misery and suffering. But the end is what mattered. And God told Job in Job 38 and 39, he says, you know what? Stand up, Job. Let me talk to you about like a man. I've got a plan in creation. And it's going to be fulfilled right over here. Now, we're not there yet. And it don't look like it's going to happen yet, but I got the plan. All you got to do is understand I'm a faithful creator. I will get my plan accomplished. We're just not there yet. <laughs> Some other things have to happen first. And that's what these people do. So they have to keep a mindset that God's going to accomplish his purpose. Why? Chapter, chapter, chapter 1 Verse 18, 1 Peter 1, 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. You know why, you know why it's going to happen for you? Because of the, of, of the blood of Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. You see, what they're doing is they have to be oriented to what God's accomplishing for them through the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And he talks, you go through 1 Peter and find that all through there. So that the hope that they have beyond the fiery trials will get them through. Now, I'm going to stop because time's, time's a little over. But 2 Peter, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, the issue in 2 Peter is the corruption that the adversary is going to seek to deceive the little flock with. Chapter 2, but there were, were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. So the congregation that is formed by, this, by, by, by the little flock over here Found, got, got this understanding of what G, they've got a better hope, a better, a better covenant, a better sacrifice. They're not going to go back to the Mosaic system. They're going to go on to, to, to outside the camp and go on to Christ. When the Antichrist sets up that Mosaic system, they're going to say, we're not going back there. That thing's over with. The cross has done away with it. We've got a better covenant, a better sacrifice, and a better hope. And they're not going to be deceived by the Antichrist trying to reestablish that old system. Those believers are then are going to be assaulted by false doctrine, false teachers that are going to try to corrupt them. First John, second John, third John is a series of tests. John says, here's what it looks like when you're a true member of the little flock. You remember when they brought Israel out of Egypt? They, there was a mixed multitude. Do you remember that term? That's a wonderful term Moses uses. Israel has a, even among the little flock, have a mixed multitude. And what that tribulation is going to do is purge out the rebel. First John chapter 2, he tells you, verse number 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there are many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Not the dispensation of grace, we're in, the, we're in prophecy now. But they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not have gone out from us. You see, there's an attempt to draw away a seduction policy. First John tells you how... There's a whole series. He says, here's what it is if you're in the real fellowship. If you do this, you're not. You've got an objective standard. Jude does the same thing. He says, by the way, you've got to earnestly contend for the faith because they're going to corrupt that. And then Revelation over here, he says, okay, prophecy is ready to be fulfilled. And the book of the Revelation looks to that hope. Revelation chapter 1. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angels unto the, his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You right back into that at hand time that John the Baptist says the kingdom of God's at hand. So here you have faith looking to the cross, getting its foundation. Here you have love looking at the brethren, getting grounded, and you're growing in grace, getting the foundation of it, and you're guarding against the corruption. And here you have the hope. There you have the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in glory. So what you have when you go through those things is that doctrine, reproof, correction that is there, and they're laid out in exactly that kind of a way so that those saints in that day can have the same kind of understanding that you and I can have today for what God's doing today. Now, if you leave those books where they are and put them and use them for what they're there for, the doctrine in those books can become a blessing to you. If you try to take that doctrine in those books and put it on yourself or someone else today, you only bring confusion. You wouldn't go back and offer an animal sacrifice just because sacrifices are in the Bible. You would say, no, that's the Old Testament. That's been done away with. Well, you don't just go anywhere in the Bible and pull out something just because you want to use it. You put it where it goes. And in its place, those, those books doctrinally are going to be tremendous. Listen, those people in the ages to come deserve a part of the Bible that is appropriate and adequate for them, just like you and I deserve a part of the Bible for us. And when you put them where they go, understand how it works, then it works. Now, there's... Every passage of Scripture has three applications. One, historically it was written to somebody in a period of time in history and it meant something to them. Two, it has some relationship to everything else in the Bible. That's the dispensational stuff. And then three, there are practical applications that you can draw from it. Most preaching just looks at the practical applications and winds up without any doctrinal foundation. The Word of God works effectually in you because you believe it. That's how you get God's Word to work. And you have to understand it before it'll, it'll do that. So anyway, I hope that helps with the, the question the folks are, that ask. They're, they're watching on the Internet. And uh, I'll talk about the five courses of judgment next week, okay? If you have a question you want to put in the question box, email it to me. That's what folks on the Internet are doing. And uh, if you have some here, well, write it down so that I don't forget it, okay? My mind is weak. I'm willing, but my mind gets kind of weak at times. I came in here a while ago, and I walked back to my office twice to remember the things I walked back there to get. You ever do that? Oh, you do it. You know what I'm talking about. You walk in a room, you go and do something, and you get there, and you, what did I come out here to do? And I had to go back twice, retrace my steps. So if you have a question, write it down, okay? All right. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for the privilege of studying it and considering what it says and letting it instruct us in Christ's name. Amen. Praise the Lord.